Okay, good morning. My name is Chris Schmidt. I am the design and technology teacher at Thetford Academy, um, basically the shop teacher. Uh, we teach woodworking, metalworking. I also teach a timber framing class, which has just raised their timber frame this past week, um, and also a graphic design class. And one of my goals when I became the shop teacher 10 years ago was to get the students to move into the 21st century design technology, including um, computer-aided design and manufacturing. Uh, we were using SketchUp as a design tool for our woodworking, and I had students who just hated using computers. Um, I recall one episode where I asked, you know, a student to sit down and work on his computer, and he slammed it down and ran out of the room in a huff. Um, and so I wanted a way to get them more motivated. And one of the ways to get them more motivated was to see some results that they wanted to achieve and therefore would have to learn the software to, to get that. And so the first machine that I bought was um, the CNC router. And we started incorporating that into our curriculum. And then we purchased uh, a very nice laser engraver. And we used that um maybe not daily but certainly weekly in here and when the students started to see some of the things they can do with it they became much more motivated to use the computers and of course with covid we were remote for a while and so students became more adept using the computers and in fact while we were remote students were able to send me their designs virtually and i lasered them for them and recorded some of that to show them and at the end of the year, they came in and picked them up. Um, so so uh, my motivation was an educational one. Uh, I'm assuming your motivation is more on the, the hobbyist, um, possibly some production work for sale. Um, and, and I'm gonna emphasize woodworking. Um, the CNC router is able to do soft metals. Uh, I do not do any soft metals on it in the shop, um, just mainly because of the cleanup. And it's much more, um, uh, you have to be much more accurate with your feeds and speeds uh, to not break a tip off. Um, as far as the laser goes, it can laser anything that will burn or etch. Um, and so you can do all kinds of different materials. But again, I'm gonna primarily emphasize woodworking. Um, so if we can switch over to the Mac computer, I have a short slideshow that I will narrate. This is our laser engraver. It's a GCC World Laser Pro Spirit GLS laser. It's only 30 watts, which is a little bit on the low power side, but it, you'll see what it's capable of doing. As far as cutting, it can cut through almost a quarter inch of cherry. Um, so uh, we don't use it for, for large cutting operations. We primarily use it for engraving and also for um, inlay. It does a great job with inlay. Um, it has to be hooked up to exhaust. So you'll see I have it actually hooked up into my welding exhaust. You can see the pipe in the back there. And that's to get the fumes out of the building. The other way to do it is with a filtration system. Um, they do have HEPA filters that you can set up if you don't have access to an exhaust system. Uh, they're fairly expensive, however. Um, it does run off a dedicated PC. And all of the... Uh, Laser Pro printers use Corel Draw as their software. This one has almost a three foot by two foot cutting table. Um, you'll see it has a, um, a cutting surface so that you can cut all the way through and you're only hitting a little bit of metal every now and then. You can see the scorching. It will not affect the metal at all. This is not a, a metal engraver. Um, but by having that, you can have the pass through of the, the flame, so to speak, and get a better cut. Uh, you can see the traveler there moves left and right and forward and back. The laser tube is down in the back, you know, isolated so no one can, can bump it. And it is aligned to a mirror. The mirror shoots the laser up to this mirror in the back left corner shoots the laser out to another mirror over here that travels with the traveler, shoots the laser out to the cutter head, and then shoots it down onto the surface. A lens that focuses it to uh, gain the intensity that you need to burn wood. 
this is the, the cutter head. The, the tube is uh, um, bringing air from an air compressor in order to blow the smoke away. Um, it keeps the uh, lens from fogging up. You do still need to clean the lens about once a month with regular use, just with some you know, lens cleaner and tissue paper. The lenses are very expensive and you, you certainly do not want to scratch them. Um, but this will travel left and right, back and forth. Uh, and the table goes up and down in order to focus. And primarily we use it for wood burning. So this is a typical project that my middle schoolers do, white pine bird feeder, and they get to laser some kind of an image on it. This is just a JPEG, you know, stolen off the internet. Uh, ideally you find something that's open source or free or you purchase it um, so that you're not uh, infringing on copyright law. Um, for educational use, it's not a big deal, but if you were selling stuff, um, you know, someone could sue you if you used their logo or, or their artwork without, uh, without permission. But I put this on here so you can see that depending on the, the speed and the power, you actually get a little bit of cutting so that you get the texture. I thought this was a good example of some texture in with the burning. And here's one of my middle school classes. They had made step stools that year and they all got to burn different things on there. Uh, my high school class, their first project is a cutting board where they use all the different tools in the shop, including the laser, to do the inlay. Uh, they learn how to use Inkscape as a design software. They can steal the image off the internet, but they have to trace it with a Bezier pen in the design software. And then we, uh, we save that onto a flash drive and bring it back to the PC and open it up in Corel Draw to run the laser. Um, and I will be demonstrating that at the end here. Here's a more intricate inlay that someone did this year. Uh, we also do some cutting projects. Um, this student wanted to build a lantern with box joints and quarter inch cherry, or as I said, I think it's just under a quarter inch. So he designed it on the software. So this is the um, you know, user interface with Corel Draw. He's drawn it out using you know, mathematical calculations as to where all those box joints go so they'll be a perfect fit. He tested it using cardboard or mat board in this case to make sure it all go together before he did it on his cherry. And then anytime you're using the laser, you should run some practice runs on a scrap of wood to see what kind of a power and a speed you need to get the best results. So here's our test where we did it at 100% power, again, with only 30 watts. We knew we had to use 100% power. We tried it at 10% speed, 5%, 0.5, and 0.1. And you can see 0.5 is the clear winner. And 0.1, while it's cutting through, it's just it, it setting the wood on fire and just charring it too much. Here it is in operation. I'm cutting all the way through a, a thick piece of cherry. You can actually see a pretty good spark as it's cutting. Here are the finished pieces with all of the joints cut out, the star, little hole for the handle. And you'll notice at the bottom, you've even done a little bit of a um, dado for the base there. It's probably only going in, you know, a 32nd of an inch or so, but it was just something to give him a location to glue that base in. Um, it's a bit of a grainy picture because we took this in the dark, but that was the final product. And then I like to use it to sign my bowls. So here's uh, the bottom of a bowl um, for someone's wedding. And then here's a photo, a different wedding, but just to see how it comes out. And I think particularly on cherry, it really does a nice job of, of giving that wood burn look. And you can, you know, you can actually um, take a photo of your own signature if you want to and turn it into a, a, a graphic. Uh, I just used a font that looked like handwriting. I think I edited it a little bit to make it look more like my signature. Um, if any of you know Mike Foster, he likes to do pyrography and then the dry brush technique. This was just a test to see if you could do that using the laser. Um, this is running at a very slow speed in order to cut deeply into the wood. And this was about an hour long run, I believe. And then I did the dry brush technique. And I've done that on some bowl rims as well. Uh, you can do it on granite. This is not the actual black granite 
finished piece. This is the photo that was then etched into the granite. Um, we did this for our secretary when her dog passed away. It's not quite as clear an image, but it comes out quite well. Um, but again, it's a very long run, uh, particularly, I think this was a 12 by 12 piece of, uh, of black granite. Um, I did take a training course. Um, I'll, I'll show you the information about it in a minute, but we learned uh, an awful lot of different materials that you could run the laser on. It can cut through acrylic. Uh, you don't want to use any polymer, so don't use um, plexiglass because you'll get a chlorine gas, but it'll cut through acrylic. Um, there are a lot of specialty products you can buy from the different laser manufacturers. Uh, these are the guys down in uh, Concord, Tech Ed Concepts. And I have uh, a lot of this information um, is going to be sent out in an email to you guys at the end of this. But uh, they do a three-day workshop in their shop using Laser Pro lasers, which was great because it was the same thing we had. Um, and uh, really gives you the, the basics. But again, you know, it was, it was three days and I walked away with a basic understanding. And I've probably got, well, I've got eight years of experience in the shop and I'm still learning something new every day. So this is not something you're gonna pick up overnight. Um, the other thing is the cost of the machines. So our Spirit GLC with a 30 watt is a $24,000 machine. We got it used half price. Um, but I think the cheapest desktop machine that GCC World makes is 15K. And it's gonna be a similar price for the other American laser tube machines. So the machines are actually, I believe, made in uh, the Philippines, but they have American laser tubes in them, which are a little bit more reliable, a little more powerful, will last a little bit longer. And they're the biggest driver of the cost. Um, but Epilog, Trotec, there are two other big names in laser cutting, laser engraving. Uh, Glowforge is a newer uh, uh, sort of educational based desktop model that starts at $4,000. It does not use a separate software. You can run that off any software, any, any image, and it's, it's run over the internet. Um, there's some pros and cons to that. And they also have a lot of materials you can buy where they're um, barcoded and you can just scan the barcode and automatically sets the speeds and feeds. So it's really set up for maybe a makerspace or a school environment. Um, and then uh, there are an awful lot of knockoffs um, or, or foreign made um, cheaper versions. And there are also a lot of kits you can buy that are considerably cheaper, um, but you, you're kind of taking a risk and, you, and, and I really think you get what you pay for. If you have the knowledge and the patience to get the parts that didn't come in or to fix the things that weren't aligned, it might be a better way to go. Um, not everybody's gonna be able to afford a $15,000 desktop machine. I think this is where the maker spaces really make a lot of sense is they can purchase, or as we did as a school, purchase an expensive machine and then make it available to a lot of different people. Um, what you're looking for, oh, and there are also some LED laser modules for some of the cheap CNC routers like the Shark. Uh, they barely burn the surface. They're, they're not gonna cut anything. They're gonna char the surface slightly. Um, I don't know much about them. Um, but at the price you pay, they can't possibly be, be doing as much as, as we would like. Uh, but what you're looking for when you, when you look for a machine is a reliable connection to your computer so your run isn't stopping mid-run. Um, often you can't get it back to where it started and that run would be, um, you know, sort of ruin the piece. Uh, adequate table space for the, for, the, for the work that you're doing. So if you're just, you know, signing the bottom of a bowl, you need a little vertical height, but you don't need a whole lot of horizontal space. But if you're trying to do inlay into a tabletop, you need to have a large machine. Or what's nice about our, GL, our, our GLC Spirit is the front door and the back door open up and you can actually do a pass through. So you can put a large piece in there. Um, the American made tube is I'm told a better laser tube um, and, and one of the largest expenses to, to purchasing it. Uh, we've had it for eight years with a lot of use. The company that had it before us was using it to cut stencils, uh, using it eight hours a day, every day for two years. And I have not seen a significant change in the power of the tube. 
So 10 years of use and it's still going well, knock on wood. Um, as I said, you want 30 watt is kind of the minimum power. 60 or 80 would be better. You wouldn't have to run it at full power all the time. And you could just turn it up to full power when you wanted to cut through something. But of course, there's going to be a higher cost. All right. Um, what I'd like to do now is switch over to the PC and demonstrate to you how I would set up an image in Corel Draw. All right, so unfortunately, Corel Draw does not have a version for, for Macintosh computers. We are a Mac school. So the kids all know how to use the, the, the MacBook Pros. So I have a, a cart of MacBook Pros, and they would do their design on the MacBook Pro, put it on a flash drive, and then bring it over to this computer. But I just wanted to show you a couple of different things. I've pulled up Corel Draw. I've set my document size to eight inches wide by five inches tall. And I'm pulled a couple images off the internet. I'm a big trout fisherman, so I've just got a nice brown trout here. Make that a little bit larger. I'm not gonna get into the details of graphic design. Um, that would be a whole nother course. But uh, I just wanna show you how you could bring an image in. I will show you, this is what we call a bitmap image or a Rasta image. And so if I zoom way in, you'll see it is pixelated. Now the laser can handle that. It will just fire more or less power in any of the grayscale, but it won't be as sharp an edge. Zoom page here, zoom page. What you can do, if I highlight it with my cursor, you can go under bitmaps and you can turn it into a vector image by tracing it. So I'm just gonna do an outline trace, detailed logo. It gives you a preview and you can see my preview doesn't have enough detail. So I can increase the detail a little bit more. You can play around with smoothing the corners and other things until you have it the way you like and then hit okay. And now you have two images on top of each other. You have the vector image and the laser image and the, I'm sorry, the, the bitmap image, which is pixelated. I'll zoom in so we can see that again. So this one's pixelated, but this one gives you that absolute crisp edge. Um, notice it's not perfect. So again, you have to decide for your use which is the best way to go. You can go back in using, for those of you who know graphic design software, you can use your node editor. If I can get that uh, selected. There we go. Node editor. Oh, it's, uh, it's frozen. Um, it's um, locked when you, when you first trace it. But you can go back in and you could edit that. I'll show that in the, in the next one that I bring up. But you could edit those nodes, move them around, get it just the way you want it. But for this particular run, um, I'm just going to use the Rasta image, the pixelated image. I think it'll come out just fine. So if I want to send it to the laser, it's really just another printer. So I would hit print. And I would just choose the Spirit GLS. We're running a little bit slow because we are uh, on the camera. And then I need to go to preferences and set the speed and power under the pen. Um, you have the ability to color code different designs and set them individually. Um, I don't bother to do that very often. I just would run a couple different runs. So I'm setting up the run just to wood burn. And I would turn my speed down for, I'm gonna do this on cherry. I've run a bunch of tests and I know that about 40%, anywhere around 40% speed and 100% power will work. Um, the Rasta image, I could leave vector checked. It doesn't matter. There is no vector on this one. So nothing will run there, but I'm gonna turn the air compressor on. And that just runs air through it, um, which will keep the wood from 
getting too hot and catching fire and it'll blow the smoke away and any of the uh, exhaust fumes so that it won't um, you know, dirty the, the uh, lens very quickly. All right. And then I have to go to advanced and I'm gonna click center. That's so that it will center it right on the center of my piece of wood. And I can hit okay and print. And that would send it off to the laser, all right? Um, while I'm here, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and show that one. So if we can switch back over to the Mac computer. All right, what I did was I pre-recorded the run so that I could uh, jump ahead. So you'd have to sit there and watch it running back and forth forever. All right, so you can just barely see the computer over there that I, I sent it over to the machine. And I'm just, this is pre-recorded. So hopefully this will work out well. Okay, so the file has been sent to the printer. I've put some cherry in just as a sample. I'm going to move the traveler until I center the red dot on the center of the wood. And I can raise the table in order to focus the laser. You know, just like a camera, it has to be within focus. It has about a one eighth of an inch, um, you know, focus range. So the pin there comes down and touches the wood and that's perfect focus. And I actually like to have it a little bit high when I'm wood burning. I find that it comes out a little bit darker. You remove the focusing pin. Close the lid for safety and hit start. And that traveler will move back and forth. I think we're running at 40% uh, speed. You can see it's still fairly quick, but it will travel back and forth 100 times per inch of vertical um, design space. As there's more horizontal image to cover it will travel further all right here we are two minutes into it you can see it's traveling the full length of the trout as it gets down to the lower fin you can see it'll start to travel a shorter distance you can see the sparks flying as it's firing the laser burning into the wood. And when it finishes the run, the traveler will go right back to the center. If you wanted to run it a second time before you move anything, you could, but in this case, I think it looks good. Once you move that traveler, you never really get it lined up again, but there's a the finished product on the raw wood. And here it is with one coat of some wipe on poly, just to give you an idea of the rich colors that you get with the cherry and the wood burning. Okay, if we can switch back to the PC, I will show you how we do the veneer. All right, so I'm going to delete this image. Uh, this image has too much detail to veneer. You can imagine what it would take to cut out all those little pieces and glue them in. So if you're doing veneer, you want something that's more of a silhouette. Now I will tell you the laser is accurate to within one one hundredth of an inch. So you can actually get quite a bit of detail, uh, but I chose a fairly simple silhouette of a trout here. To do the veneer, you have to have a vector image. So again, this is a rasterized JPEG that I got off the internet. Um, and so I am gonna do that same bitmap, um, outline trace, logo, hit OK. And you can see that it has the nodes. If you know anything about using the Bezier pen, you create nodes and you actually, why it's called vector graphics is these are the vectors and they affect the curve. So you can make any adjustments. You could add an eyeball if you wanted to, um, whatever it would be to make it your own design. Just gonna undo that here. And right now I have two images on top of each other. So I'm gonna move that out of the way and delete the Rasta image. Now it doesn't matter where I put this on my 
wood, because I've chosen center, this X right in the middle of it, that's what's gonna be centered. That's where the traveler is gonna start, is right on that X. And again, uh, let's see, I wanna give it an outline. So I'll go hairline outline. And just so you can see that, I can give it zero fill. There's my hairline outline. That's what I'm gonna to use to cut out the veneer. But with the fill, I'll cut out the negative space. So to do the negative space, I'll go ahead and hit print. And I don't need to choose the spirit again because I have the same document open. But if I go to preferences and pen, I need to turn it down so that it will burn in quite a ways. And I've found that with cherry, somewhere around 13% will burn in about a 32nd of an inch. I need both Rasta and Vector on and click and the air compressor. And I have it centered, just double check that I have it centered, yes. And I can send that and that'll show up as you know document number one on the printer. But then I need to send another version of it where I have the exact same design, but with no fill just the vector outline. And I can print, print that. There usually isn't this delay when I'm working at the, at the uh, laser. I think the delay is because we're hooked into a TV monitor. Um, but again, I need to change it even more slow speed I gotta go down to like seven or 8% in order to make sure I cut all the way through the veneer. What you don't wanna do is, is not quite cut through the veneer. And then as you're snapping it out, you, you, know, you break off one of the details, particularly anything that's short grain. If you've got any short grain, you really wanna make sure that you turn this down. If you turn it down too low, you'll start to burn too much of the wood. You'll have a charred edge, but you wanna turn that down. And again, that's why you would do uh, test runs and see what's cutting it through. It's also why you have to make sure you have a perfect focus. If you're out of focus, you won't get nearly as good uh, a cut, as clean a cut, all right? And it's still on center, and I can send that to the printer. Okay, print. And now stored in the printer will be both runs. And if we switch over to the Mac, I've got a video of that as well. that on full screen for you. All right, so here's um, untitled. This is actually the second document because it's, I've already done the, um, the wood burning version. And so this will be the negative space. Okay, the first run that we're gonna do is the negative space. We're set up at 13% speed. I've refocused it and centered it. And you can see it's traveling quite a bit more slowly. Six minutes in, and we're almost done. You'll see that by going more slowly at 100% power, you burn more deeply. That's about a 32nd of an inch. So then we'll set up to run the positive image out of the veneer. We're at 7% speed, roughly. I've taped in a piece of walnut veneer so it won't move around as the air blows. And we're doing the vector outline. And again, you'll see it uh, sparking more there as it cuts through the wood. Now, I always like to check and see that it cut all the way through before I move anything, because once you move that traveler, You'll never get it back to the exact same spot. That looks pretty good. I can gently break it out. There we go. And you have a perfectly cut veneer in the exact same shape as your negative space. And theoretically, it should fit perfectly just like that.
Now, yesterday I had a student help me out um, to demonstrate to you how we would glue this in. We just use um, regular wood glue. I use the Type Bond 2, put a thin layer, make sure you get it into all the corners, line the veneer up, make sure it's down in its little pocket there. And then you need something flat over it. We just use um, plexiglass so you can see that it stays in the space and then that won't get glued to the wood. Put it in a wood vise. You know, we're trying to get like 200 pounds of pressure on there if we can. We don't want that veneer to buckle. And if it's sitting up a little high, you can add a Jorgensen clamp. Put that in there, you know, all day. And then we take it out, a little bit of sanding and one coat of wipe on poly. And here's what you get. A really nice veneer. Okay, good morning. This is the second half of our computer-aided design and manufacturing demonstration today. We're gonna to be talking about the CNC router. I'm Chris Schmidt, the design technology instructor at Thetford Academy. I'm in my wood shop. And uh, one of our um, new toys that we got about eight years ago is a CNC router. If you wanna to switch to the Mac, we got a little slideshow to show you first. Then I'll demonstrate the software and then we'll actually see it live and in action. All right, so this was unboxing day when it arrived. Um, it is a two foot by three foot workspace um, with a liquid cooled spindle. Um, and so it does not need a router in it. It's got its own spindle. Um, computer controlled with a handheld, it's actually a rich auto handheld control unit just like you would use in, in most manufacturing environments. Um, and so the kids were excited. Uh, I'm excited the kids are learning something that they might use if they went down and worked for, you know, one of the furniture manufacturers around here. Um, but it had several components. It has the, the gantry, the table, has three servo motors, and you can see the, the drive screws that um, there's the horizontal one on the gantry that you can see there. That's the Y axis. You can see the vertical one behind the motor. That's the Z axis. And then the X axis is actually down under the table um, that moves the whole thing back and forth, uh, up and down. Uh, it has a computer unit there on the side. Um, you can purchase a stand for it, but the shipping of the stand alone was $500. Um, I don't think this, I think the stand was 250 and the shipping was 500. So I built my own stand. And um, this is a company called Axiom out of Columbus, Ohio. I think it was a couple of, um, couple of guys out of the engineering school at Ohio State who started it. And I think this was one of the first you know, models that they developed um, eight years ago. They are now one of the leading manufacturers of sort of hobbyist. Uh, and I would say this is sort of a, a step up above. This is their pro series. Um, but, uh, I think it's really outstanding machine. Uh, the only difficulty I've had with it is it has a multi-prong plug in the back. And if the kids bump that, um, you know, seriously, some of those prongs don't, don't connect just right. It'll mess up the controls. Uh, but they've been absolutely outstanding with customer service as well. Every time I've called them, they've walked me through it. We've isolated the problem and fixed it. Um, another issue was, you know, maybe six years into it, it wasn't working right. I called them up and they said, yeah, you need a software update. And they just emailed it to me, uh, put it on a flash drive, put it into the handheld unit. And in 15 minutes, it was up and running. So I can highly recommend these guys, Axiom out of Columbus, Ohio. And that'll be in the, uh, in the, the information that's sent out to you in an email. Mostly what we use it for is making signs. So here's one of my students made a sign, some natural edge cherry, uh, both text and what I call 2D plus carving. All right, a little bit of depth to it. We made all of the signs for our trail system behind the academy. Um, but you can use it for furniture making as well. So obviously the, uh, the, the three feet of this table be a little difficult to get those all exact, you know, using a bandsaw and a spindle sander and everything else. 
Um, but he was able to design it on the computer and cut three of them to be absolutely exactly the same, including the angle that goes up against the, um, the neck there on the CNC router. Uh, he did turn the neck on the lathe, and then he could have turned the tabletop, I suppose, on the lathe, but it's pretty large for a lathe. So he, he cut that out also on the CNC machine, including putting a bevel all the way around it. Um, more furniture, this is, this is a gun rack. We have quite a hunting culture here at TA. So a vertical gun rack that was all designed, including the joinery and cut on the laser. Another gun rack, a round gun rack this time, this is the base. Uh, and you can see the pockets are being cut out a little at a time. Um, that's using a quarter inch end mill, so with a flat bottom to it. And you can only go so much at a time. You don't want to um, you know, tax the machine too much. You could snap the bit off. Or what happens is if it overheats, it'll shut down. So I usually go uh, 0.2 depth each time. And then the step over has to be um, the radius of the tool, no more than the radius of the tool. So it, it does take many passes, um, but you just stand there and watch it do its thing. So the students will design it on computers. Again, this is a software BCarve Pro that runs only on PCs. So we had to buy a couple of PCs and the students learn how to use the PCs. Um, VCarve Pro is a Vectric software. They're a company out of England. Um, pretty good customer service, a fairly expensive software. What I love about it though, is that they have outstanding tutorials that come with the software. And when you're using it, they're right there off to the side. So if you wanna go watch one of their tutorials to see how to do something, you can. And the VCarve Pro will do, um, up to 2D plus carving. If you want to do three-dimensional carving, if you wanted to carve a full, you know, rosette or something, um, or the, you know, um, you would have to get an additional software and a much more complicated design and a much longer run. So I'm going to stay away from full 3D carving today and just stick to uh, 2D and 2D plus and emphasize uh, making signs. This is one of their tutorials. Um, just this was the first thing that I did. And you can even download their file or you can create the file yourself. And the only thing they don't tell you is the speeds and feeds to set up your machine at. Um, and so I was a little worried, you know, that I would run it too fast or you know, that I wouldn't have the cutter head going at the right speed. As it turns out for wood, you've got a really big margin of error. You get a big window that will work. Um, basically the more wood you're taking off, the slower the, the, the feed rate you want. So you would slow your traveler down a bit. Um, the cleaner the cut is the speed of the cutter head. Um, I tend to run my cutter head at 1800 RPMs. Um, and that's adjustable on this machine. They don't tell you because they don't know exactly what machine you have, what bit you're using and or what, what material you're using. And it's all fine tuned if you want to. But like I said, um, I was very worried about it when I first got the machine, as it turns out, um, you can kind of tell by ear, um, you can see about what kind of a clean cut you're getting, how much tear out you're getting or not. But there's a very big margin of error, a big window for, for um, doing wood. But if you want to learn how to use Vectric VCarve Pro software, this is where you're going to learn it, is from their tutorials. Um, you can go online. Again, I'm sure everything you need to know is somewhere in some YouTube video. Um, but what, everything I know is either from watching these tutorials or trial and error. Uh, the nice thing about it is it has a preview. So this is a preview of a sign. And you can, you can you know, test the runs and see what it's going to look like before you go to the machine and realize that you had your X and Y axis switched. So it was going the long way instead of the vertical way. And uh, you, know, you can make sure that it's, it's going to look like what you want it to. Um, uh, it's great at drilling holes and particularly patterns of holes. So this is a cribbage board that I did for um, the daughters of some friends of ours. And 
Yes, I stole the uh, logos there for the um, Chicago. Uh, what is that? The uh, Penguins. And what's the other one? Is that Chicago? I don't know, but hockey teams. Uh, if you were selling this, you would not be able to legally steal logos. Uh, notice that for every cut, there are two lines because I'm going to be, uh, I would run this with the uh, V carved bit and it, it will cut between two lines. And then the circles I'm going to do with an end mill, in that case, an eighth inch end mill. And so all of those are eighth inch holes. So it'll just do one plunge in and out. And there's the final product. Again, cherry with a, a wipe on poly finish. Um, here's a sign that I did for my sister where I wanted to um, incorporate some, some fairly elaborate design. And I actually did purchase the vine and the apple tree. I think it cost me like $1.95 or something for each one. Uh, there's no way I could have designed those on my own uh, for that price. So sometimes it's easiest just to, to, to buy your graphics from the internet. Or there are a lot of uh, open source free graphics that you can get. Um, this is Inkscape. All right, so that's where I like to do my original designing. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but you could use Adobe Illustrator or you could do it directly in VCarve Pro. But I would take this, save it as a .svg, sizable vector graphic, and then reopen it in uh, VCarve Pro. Here it is in VCarve Pro. The sign was larger than my cutting table. And so I've done what's called tiling, where you'll do half of it as one run, slide it over, line it up exactly where you left off, and run the other half of it. And VCarve Pro has the ability to do that built right into it. In fact, we did a, uh, uh, a big square sign that had four tiles. Um, and so you can do it both horizontally and vertically. Um, the key is you have to have a system to line it up. So if you have a fence, and a little mark on the fence that's your zero point. You can just slide it over until your center is on that, do the other half. Here's the preview. And so I've used the V carve bit to bevel the outside edge, put a bevel perimeter around it with inside fillets, carve the design and carve the lettering. And then I used probably a quarter inch end mill to make that curved cut along the top. Here it is as it came off the machine. I had uh, primed it first. It's out of cedar and it does tend to chip a little bit. So by priming it, you've sealed that edge, strengthened that edge just a little. Um, it also saves you from having to, to prime it except for the, the lettering, All right? So that's the off the machine. And by far the most difficult part of the project was the painting. And then here it is on her garage, actually, at their little um, family farm there. Uh, this is one of the bowls, I think, that I sent a picture of. And I actually have this, it's just a really short clip. But you were talking about holding it down. Notice that I kept it in the um, jaws. And I've clamped the jaws to the table in a, in a sort of makeshift way, but I've really got it down there so it can't move. Um, Cause there's gonna be a fair amount of leverage as it's hitting that bowl rim. The bowl rim is not perfectly flat. And since a V carve bit will be as wide as it is, it will be as deep as it is wide. I have done the two rims on the outside, the outer rim and the inner rim. I made those a little bigger in the software, knowing that they would end up being a little thinner on the actual product. And I'm just gonna play it here for a second. So you can see it actually goes up and down as it goes both forward and back and left and right, using all three axes at the same time to give you that carving. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I would like to be able to hand carve a bowl rim like that, but I just don't have the time or energy or patience or skill to do it. Um, and so this is my, my solution to that. And here's the final product. Um, 
a very uh, a fairly dry foam brush with black milk paint lightly applied over the top of that. You will see there's a little bit where it got down into the carving. Um, you could paint it first and carve through it, but I like to do a little bit of sanding after the carving to get rid of any of the you know little fuzz that gets pulled up. Here's another bowl rim. Another one, again, with milk paint that's buffed away a little bit. Uh, and then back to some of my current students uh, work. This is a shelf that's gonna also be a hat rack. And he just wanted to do a little bit of curved work for the supports for the braces. So he did two of those. This is a student making a shaker bookshelf. And so he's carved the shape of the feet, the dado across there, the rabbit up the back and drilled all of the holes for, um, you know, he wanted to be able to set the shelves at different heights. And uh, one of the things that's really nice is you can just, um, in the design, you just draw one circle and then you just reapply it at different locations. Your uh, X number will stay the same and your Y number, I think he just went up by two inches. And so it's very easy to draw all of those. And then when you get them and then to drill them, you don't need a template or anything. It'll just drill them all perfectly where you want them. And you can see it gets a really nice fit out of that. If you, if you did a three quarter inch rectangle there, you get a three quarter inch piece of wood going into it. You know, it's a perfect fit. And he hasn't, um, he's putting some trim around the front, a little bit of trim around the top, and then uh, he'll put his shelves in. So he's almost done with that. Uh, this was a birthday present I made for my wife. It's another cribbage board, but it opens up. And I pocketed out a uh, um, you know, perfectly sized rectangle for the cards with the little finger holes there, another pocket for the pegs. I even um, routed out where the hinges go. And then I used a different, oh, and, and a little circle to glue in a couple of magnets to hold it closed. And then I used the um, V-carve bit to do the writing. And this was a really fun project. I love to fish and tie flies. So this was a, a fly tying bench that I designed on the computer and cut using the CNC router. Um, and again, this information will be sent out to you in an email, but uh, as with the lasers, you, you really get what you pay for. Um, I highly recommend the Axiom. As I said, we have the Pro Series. I think it cost us $8,000 at the time. I think it's up to about 10 or 12 now, as you know, everything's going up. Um, we made our own base to save some money. Um, it doesn't move around. I, 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 it, it's on wheels and I made extensions to kind of have it come up off the wheels and sit solidly. And I never have to use it. It doesn't really move around much on its own. Um, so a pretty simple base. Um, a cheaper version would be Next Wave's Shark. Uh, you'll see that advertised on Rockler Woodworking, a lot of the woodworking sites. Um, ShopBot was sort of the standard in engineering schools and, and, and shops. Um, it has its own specific version of VCarve Pro. I think they now have uh, handheld control units, but the original ones, you had to connect your PC to the, to the machine and it would often crash mid-run. So again, you're looking for that reliable connection, which, which in this case is a handheld unit. Um, and a lot of the cheaper ones, you have to put a router into them. So you're, you're basically running a router in a gantry that's computer controlled. Whereas this one has the spindle and you can change you know, the cutter speed and, and it's liquid cooled, which is nice. Let's say you have to do a two hour run. You wanna make sure you're keeping that cool. Um, table size, you know, boy, it would be nice to have a four by eight table but I just couldn't afford it. So two by three has done most of what we want. But again, if you're, if you're able to get to a maker space, you know, maybe they have one that's got a four by eight table on it. You could be cutting, you know, sheet goods. Um, and again, the reliable connection. Uh, the graphic design software, like I said, Adobe Illustrator is the industry standard for uh, vector graphics, but it's very expensive. Um, I do use it for professional work. My wife uses it for her, her professional work. But Inkscape is almost as good. 
Um, you know, it's a little quirky at times, but it's open source, it's free, and you can just save your files as .svgs and open them in any other vector software. The other nice thing about both those softwares is there are thousands and thousands of tutorials online. So if you need to know how to do something, if you are very, very specific about your query when you do your search, uh, you'll find a dozen videos showing exactly what you want to know. And the key is narrowing it down, figuring out which ones you like. So what I have my students do is um, I have a few channels of people who I think are really good educators. And I have them uh, you know, put those into their favorites bar. So if I want to know how to do something in Illustrator, um, I go to that channel and I, I ask that particular YouTube channel to find it because I know it's going to be a real high quality video um, you know, in English that I can understand, uh, fairly efficient in how it presents it. Um, some of those videos can, can really be uh, you know, uh, painful to, to listen to. So the, the biggest thing as far as learning the um, design software is being able to find the best tutorials online. And then if you aren't familiar with SketchUp, I highly recommend it, um, but don't use the current Trumbull SketchUp online version if you can help it. It's really clunky and you have to have a good online connection or else it shuts down on you. I guess the only nice thing about it is that it saves automatically. Uh, but what I have all my students do is we download SketchUp 2017, which is back when it was a Google product. And that exists on your computer so that you can use it when you're not hooked up to the internet. Um, and you can, you can you know, do a three-dimensional design in SketchUp, but then if you use you know, control one or two or three to get a, a straight on view, you can save it as a two-dimensional model and then upload that into either VCarve Pro or Corel Draw. Um, so it can, it can save you a little bit of the um, hassle of redesigning it in another software. All right. What I'd like to do next is switch over to the PC and show you how VCarve Pro works so that we can then get to the uh, good part, which is watching the machine in action. All right, so here's VCarve Pro. And all of these uh, vector softwares have similar um, tools. It's just remembering, you know, where's the right button for this one. Um, Nightly by VCarve Pro, all your recent files are right there. And then all those tutorials are right there in the sidebar. So if you're trying to do, I don't know, a pocket, you don't remember how to set up the pocket tool path, you go watch one on that. It'll show you how to do it. But I'm just going to create a new file. All right, gives you the job set up. And I'm going, um, I'm going a height of 10 today and a thickness of 0.75. The thickness only really matters if you're cutting all the way through. You wanna make sure you're cutting through a little bit, but not too far through. You can go off any corner or I'm gonna go off the center for my zero, for my, my um, origin. And I can hit okay. And we are gonna just make a quick sign here. So there are lots of different tools. You can draw circles, you can draw rectangles. Let's just show you a circle. You can tell it the radius or the diameter. You can tell it the center point. All right, so if you wanted it centered, you could go zero, zero. Let's say a, we'll go diameter, a four inch diameter, create, and there it is. And if you wanted a concentric circle, maybe you were doing something with a wall thickness, you could go three, create, and there's another one. Um, there are ways to align and center them. All the things that you could do in any design software are built in here. It's a tad clunky as most PC softwares are in graphic design, but I'm getting used to it. But I just went and found a nice, I thought we would do a rose today. And I'm gonna use the, um, the V-carve bit with a 90 degree angle. And so it's gonna go as deep as the positive image is wide. So, you know, if I've got a linear image, I want a little bit of depth to that. I want a little width. I don't want any thin lines. You know, this is probably as thin a line as I would want is in these little curly cues. But I don't want any really large areas either. So like these leaves are, are bordering on too large. They'll be all right. 
Um, but you'll see that won't come out quite as well as the, the rose pattern does. Uh, I believe this is a Rasta image. Let's zoom in again, find my zoom selection. Yeah, so you can see this is a, a Rasta image. So it won't work unless it's a vector image, but I can use, and I don't know why they had a chicken, but that's the trace bitmap. And again, you can set up, you know, it's gonna be in black and white in this case, what the threshold is. You can set how close the corners fit get rid of any noise filters. So if there's like a two or three pixel that you don't even want to pick up, you can turn that down. So there's a lot of things you can play around with here, but it has a nice preview feature. All right, so you can see what it's going to look like, and then you have to hit apply. And the only thing I dislike about this software is anytime you use a tool, you've got to close it. So I've closed that tool. Now I've got both the original image and the vector image. All right, so there's the original image off to the side and here's the vector image. So I wanna get rid of the Rasta image and just keep the vector image. And then it each closed shape will be its own vector, its own curve. And if I wanted to edit it, those of you who know about node editing, you can go in and you could you know, change things a little bit or not, um, you can add, you could delete, let's say you didn't want something, you could just go in and delete it. Control Z to undo what I just did. I'm gonna zoom page and I'm gonna add some text. So I'm gonna use the text tool. Um, and again, text with variable thickness comes out really nicely with the V-carve but you don't want too much that's too thin. So you wouldn't want a linear text. You want something with some, some thickness to it. Um, you can choose your font. Um, I like either a script font or a scrolled font. So I'm gonna go with a scrolled font here. Get bold italic. Uh, you can align it left, center, or right. I'm gonna go center. You can set the height and you can set the anchor point. Um, I'm just going to let it be at one inch tall and zero, zero to start with. I'm just going to write spring, write whatever you want, obviously, and apply. All right. Uh, close that. Now, let's say I wanted it to be in a different place. I can move it. I can resize it. I can align it center. There's all kinds of things that you can do. Um, I'm really not going to get too much in depth. Um, I will just say if anyone is working with this software and runs into trouble, one of the things that can, can really mess it up is if your vectors aren't closed. So if you've drawn something, let's zoom in somewhere here. If I were to zoom in right here, for instance, if the two lines are very, very close but not touching, you'll have an open vector. Therefore, you won't have a double line here that you're going to stay in between when you're carving between the lines. Your double line will be whatever the next line is that's drawn. And it will completely change how the machine interprets your software, your, your design. So you've got to make sure that all your, all your vectors are closed. Um, that's one of the issues that my students run into a lot. Uh, again, you can, you can combine shapes. So if you're doing um, you know, a curved leg, you're probably gonna use a couple of circles, a couple of arcs, and then you can combine them. You can clip off the part you don't want. Um, it's fairly uh, user-friendly, but it does take, you know, the, the, the learning curve's pretty steep and it takes quite a while to really get the details. My students pick up the basics pretty quickly, but they're always calling me over and saying, Mr. Schmidt, what do I need to do here? And then it takes me a minute to figure it out. Um, all right, we'll call this good enough. We don't want it to take too long on the run. So now I've got my design and I'm gonna just, you know, I could save it to the desktop in case I wanna get back to it later on. Uh, I'm not gonna actually save it, but you can save it. This is what my students forget to do sometimes is save the file. But it's not the file that's going to run the machine. It's something called G code. All right. You need the tool path translated into a different computer 
language called G code. And so I go up here and I switch to the toolpath mode. And I've got different tool paths. So if I were doing a cutout of a curved leg, let's say, I would use the profile tool path and the bit would probably be a quarter inch end mill. If I'm doing a pocket, like a, um, you know, a dado to put a shelf into, I would use the pocket. And again, I'd probably use a quarter inch end mill, maybe a little bit larger one. If I'm drilling holes, I would use the drilling tool path. Um, I don't use these other ones much, but the one we're gonna use today is V-carve. All right, that's set up to, to do the, um, you know, it's kind of like the old Roman letter um, carving, wood carving that people would do by hand. And uh, you can choose that. And then it says, what's your start depth? Well, I'm gonna start at the top of the block, which is zero. And then where is it gonna be so low that you don't wanna go any deeper? Now, I don't have to worry. I don't have anything. This is a three quarter inch piece of wood. Nothing is three quarters of an inch wide. So it's not gonna cut through the wood anywhere. But if I didn't want it to cut through the wood in these leaves, for instance, I could, I could set a depth at which it will stay flat. Um, it will run tiny, tiny step overs because it's a pointed tool and you'll end up with a little corduroy effect, but you can set a flat depth. I'm gonna leave it alone. You can choose the bit. Um, in this case, I'm gonna go with the 90 degree bit. I also have a 60 degree bit, but we'll go with the 90 degree bit. Uh, I don't care about plunging any of this other stuff, but I'm gonna name it something that I will be able to find in five letters or less. So why don't we just say spring and calculate. Oh, gotta select the vectors first. Control A, we'll so oops, control A. Uh, zoom page so you can see what I'm doing here. So now I've selected the vectors and I can hit calculate. And it'll calculate the tool paths. It does all of that for you. It calculates the order in which it does them. And I have not, it's supposed to be a fairly efficient order that it does them in, but the red lines that you see is when it's above the wood and not cutting. You wanna make sure no red line is gonna travel across where you're um, clamping it or else you'll cut through your clamp. But in this case, it's all gonna stay internally, no problem. The blue lines are where it's gonna run. And we can actually preview that. It's only one tool pass, so we'll preview it all at once. And I'm gonna turn the speed down so you can see it go slowly here, the preview. Oh, not that slowly. <coughs> There you go. And by previewing it, you make sure it looks like what you're hoping for. You can make sure you're not cutting through any of your clamps. You get an idea where your clamps are. You can see, you can actually look at it from an angle, see that things are cut to a depth you like. Once you're happy with that, you can, you can even save an image of this to send to a client if you're doing something for a client. But now we need to save the tool path. So I go over to this button here, save tool path. You choose the brand of machine and VCarve is gonna have just about every brand out there, but I've already got it set up for Axiom. And then I need a flash drive, put my flash drive in here and I hit save tool path. Close that for a second, save tool path and tell it to save it to the flash drive. You'll see I've got an awful lot of stuff on here because kids have been using the machine quite a bit lately. Um, save. That's why you wanna make sure you name it something that you're gonna find. Uh, don't name it pocket because some other kid might've named one pocket and you won't know which one is yours. All right, so I've saved it there. I'm just gonna make sure I eject the disk correctly. And we're gonna move over to the, um, to the machine. So if we can switch, we're just turning the camera on, we're gonna switch cameras. So again, this is our CNC router, um, computer control unit. I did not buy the toolbox. I just bought a cheap toolbox at Home Depot to keep track of my tools. And I built the stand with the shelf, put some wheels on it. It's locking wheels, I never bothered to lock them. Um, it doesn't really seem to go anywhere. Um, 
to clamp it down, I got from Rockler, you know, these little, these little clamp units that slide in. You've got the original aluminum base, and then this one comes with a sacrificial wood base. Tighten that nice and tight, because again, you don't want that to move around. Uh, I have um, hot glued on a, a fence on the left so that I can get it lined up um, perfectly in line with the, in this case, the Y axis of the gantry, all right? And I've got the flash drive. The flash drive has to go into the handheld unit. Okay, Rich Audi, handheld unit before you turn it on. Uh, it runs on a 220 outlet, which is why it's at the front of the room. It's our only 220 outlet that wasn't uh, in use. So we share it with our wide belt sander. Give it a moment to warm up. While it's warming up, let me just show you, it, it does have a dust collection skirt, just magnetic, sticks on there, four inch dust collection hose and your standard, you know, portable dust collector that can follow it around and that'll pull all the chips up so it doesn't make a mess. But it's no fun because you can't watch it. All right, so it's warmed up. I'm gonna hit all axis home. Brings it all the way up to the highest Z it'll go, all the way to the furthest left it will go and all the way to the furthest forward it will go. And then it'll just double check that as it's absolute home. Then I've got to set it up um, to my origin. I can use the X plus, the Y plus, I can do it at the same time, and the Z minus. I don't want to touch the wood. I stop just before the wood. Yeah, this part is not a big deal whether they see it so much. I'll get it lined up right over the center. And then I could hit X, Y goes to zero. And that will give you my origin because the um, document setup, I chose center. I'm gonna bring it up a little bit to give me some space. And then in my toolbox, I've got this handy dandy aluminum puck. All right, plugs in the back here to create a low voltage circuit which is currently open. And there are two buttons that I hit at the same time. It'll come down and touch the puck, closing that low voltage circuit, subtracting the height of that puck and finding the top of the block as my Z zero, all right? Um, once I've done that, I can put the puck away. It's very important with V-carve since the depth of the cut determines the width of the cut that we start off at exactly top of the block for zero, right? Um, all right, so I've got it lined up right over my, I, I put a little black dot on there so you can see, but I found the center, I've set the origin to center and I'm ready to run. So I hit run. And it asks, where is the file? Currently the file is on, let's see, just show you the, the control unit. It says, where is the final? It's on the disc. So I hit okay. And then I can use the up and down buttons to find it. So we called it spring. It does not put them in alphabetical order. It doesn't put them in, in sequential order of any kind. I haven't figured out why they go where they go, but you go until you find it. So there's spring.mmg. You hit OK. At this point, if you wanted to, you could change um, cutter head speed and all of that, but, but the software takes care of it. So I really don't have to change anything except for the travel speed, which is currently set up at half, uh, half speed. And I can change that while it's running if I want to. I'll show you that in a minute. I'll hit OK one more time. I've got my safety glasses on. I'll step back so you can see. And I've got my hand over the stop button in case something goes wrong. And like I said, the software determines what order it does things in. To 
free to zoom way in at some point. So it chose to do the lettering first. It did the I and then the N. I, then it went back to do the R. I don't know why, but that's what it does. Now I can speed it up a little bit. I'm gonna hit the Y plus while it's running to speed it up to full speed. Might not give me quite as clean a cut, but that way you guys don't have to sit around waiting as long. So um, where I'm not going very deep anywhere, I'm not worried about the sawdust getting in the way. If I were cutting a, a profile and I was going through an inch of wood, I would either um, use a uh, vacuum with a plastic tip that I could hopefully not run into the cutter head to vacuum it out. Or if I'm using upcut spiral bits, it pulls all the stuff right out and I just leave it there. But if you wanna blow it off so you can see a little better, you can. Now you'll notice that the spindle is almost silent. You do get a little chatter as you're cutting. But one of the advantages to this product is it's, it's not that loud. Now I chose something to be a pretty quick run. I'm guessing it's got, you know, maybe two minutes, two or three minutes to go. But if you're doing um, particularly a large pocket or if you're doing 3D carving, you might need to let it run for two or three hours. And that's why it's important to have the liquid cool. You do want to stick around and keep an eye on it in case anything goes wrong, like your wood moves. Um, I wouldn't, you know, run it, walk away, have lunch, come back and hope that nothing went wrong. But you could be, you know, checking your email or whatever it might be while it's running. The kids love to just stand here and watch it. Uh, three or four of them will gather around just to kind of see what happens. And it's gonna come back and do the G last. I don't quite know why, the G and the... Now, once it's done, you have to look and say, hey, am I happy with that? Because I could go a little bit deeper and carve a little bit. Some of those thin lines are not particularly wide. I think it's fine. But if you want to run it again, do it before you move anything. You could lower your Z height by a millimeter or so and run it again if you wanted to. Um, I'm going to say it's fine. I'm going to just get this out of the way. and unclamp it. Let's see if we can use the light. Yeah, there we go. So you can see the shadow. All right, very light sanding. You can see how close can we get with it staying in focus. There really isn't much tear out at all anywhere, you know, a tiny bit maybe in here, but a little light sanding. I, I usually have the kids um, sand the surface to 220 first. How about putting a finish on before? You can put a finish on before as a, as a first coat. That'll seal it a little bit. Um, if you're gonna paint it, I tend to put a sealer on before I paint it so the paint doesn't absorb into the tubes of the wood, right? Um, but if you put a finish on of any kind, even just clear polyurethane, just a little clear polyurethane, it'll darken where it absorbs into the end grain and it'll really pick up the contrast. Right now I'm just using sort of the light to get that contrast.
And you can see how nice the lettering comes out. You got those serifs that are really sharp as it comes, as it comes into the point, it's rising up on the Z axis and giving a really nice point and fine detail. All right, um, so CNC router, computer numeric controlled. The computer's doing all the math for you. I tell my students, it's all based upon vector math. And I explained to them a little bit what a vector is with you know, a, a, an origin, a magnitude and a direction. Um, they have no interest in that whatsoever. I try to make connections to the, to the math class. Um, but once they realize what it's capable of doing, then they all wanna learn the software in order to get that result. So, any questions? I, I guess I'm gonna come in again. Um, now, when it was doing the G at the end, you noticed that it did it in multiple passes. Is there a pecking amount that you pick or does it do it on its own? It does it on its own. The thing I can set is how deep it will go at any one pass. So let's say there was a really wide area where it was gonna go half an inch deep. I can tell, I can set up the specs for that particular tool to go no more than a quarter inch at a time. Because you can imagine if you went down a, an inch yeah, into yeah, the wood yeah. and tried to move, it would, it would be a problem. Um, so I can tell it how deep it will go and then it'll run that in several passes to do a little bit at a time. But as far as when it comes up over and starts again, that's all something that the software is doing automatically. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's supposed to be fairly efficient, but as you saw, why did it wait to do the G last? I don't know. And why did it do the G in, you know, a couple different passes? I don't know, um, but it's fairly quick. Um, the thing that takes a long time is a pocket. If you're doing a big pocket, particularly a deep pocket where you're only going like 0.2 at a time, that can take a while. And is quite a bit louder, to be honest with you. If you're cutting, you know, a 0.2 with a quarter inch end mill, it will start to screech a little bit. Um, particularly if the end mill is set, you know, an inch, get my, my finger, there we go. An inch down, there's a little vibration in the tool bit. Um, and so you will get a little more screeching. But in general, it's a, it's a relatively quiet tool, which I cannot tell you how important that is to me in this shop so that I can talk to kids, so that I can listen to what their tools are doing, and just for my peace of mind. Um, if they've got, you know, what's the loudest tool? Oh, the planer. The planer drives me nuts. Uh, we don't have a um, helical head. And so if they're running the planer and the overhead blower, and I'm trying to talk to someone, you know, I'm, I'm yelling at the top of my lungs to try to be, to communicate with them. And uh, by the end of the day, that can really be a rough day. So uh, this is a great toy. It was, I, I love it. And if anyone wants to come in and try something sometime, um, you know, your local maker space, or if you live in this area, I'm happy to have you come in. Um, I know that, uh, you know, it's always nice to see something in action live and try something before you invest a lot of money in it. Um, they do now make a desktop version of this, as well as a, a more entry level, smaller one with a smaller, you know, this was the medium sized one when I got it. And they now make a full four by eight sized one. And the price is all very nice thing about them is all their prices are listed and you order them directly from the manufacturer. I will tell you that GCC world they do not list their prices for their lasers. They just say inquire. If you, if, if you have to inquire, you know that they're expensive. Chris, I could see, um, I, I, I can envision a whole bunch of problems when you try to do the finishing. Um, could you comment on, on how you do uh, finishing for both um, patterns you make on the CNC and, and also on the laser engraving? Sure, let's start with the laser engraving because we're primarily wood burning. We almost always put on a wipe on poly because we're, we don't have a dust free environment. And so they can wipe it on, let it sink in, wipe it off. And it doesn't matter if it gets coated in sawdust by the end of the day, that all just wipes off. And we'll, 
typically we'll just do two coats unless it's something that we really care about, like a tabletop, and then we'll just keep doing it day after day and put on eight coats. Um, that will change the color of the wood burning just slightly. Um, can you put it on me again? And, and again, that's why I like to darken the, as much as I can the wood burning so that you will you lose a little bit of contrast when you put your finish on. But you know, it's, a, it's a relatively clear really finish. Good. So, you know, you can see you get pretty good contrast there. I imagine on you a have, lighter have a really wood, dry cloth so it doesn't puddle in the, uh, in the small uh, engraving. Oh, it, it soaks right in, no problem. Okay. And when you wipe it off, there's not a whole lot of char. Um, so it's not like you're wiping, smearing charcoal around. Um, unless you ran it at, you know, 0.1 and then you would be. But if you're running it in focus, you get almost no charcoal. It's all burned pretty cleanly. Um, so that's the finish we put on these. Uh, obviously, if you wanted to paint it, you would paint it first. And then do it at, and, and burn through the paint. So um, some of them like to do baseball bats. They like to paint the barrel. So they'll paint the barrel and then the laser through it and they'll get the white wood. If they're doing ash, they'll get the white wood. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, yeah, you got to think about how you're going to work with the finish. Um, let me grab a couple samples here. Uh, I always recommend if you're doing like your masterpiece that you do a test run first. This was a platter that I had turned on the lathe. Oop, here we go. And I would burn, I, I used the laser to burn the trout on it. And I used the CNC router to carve the rim. Um, and then I put, you know, general finishes finish on it. But here's a, a test run for a stool. All right, we were talking about the, compass rows, right? So they painted it first and then did that. This was a sample for a sign out at the end of our road, TA that way. Um, what did we do? We primed it, we routed it, we primed it again, then we painted the white then we used a palm sander to sand off the, the flat. And then we used a very dry brush for the green and tried not to drip any into the where the white is. Uh, if you know any professional sign painters, if you ever tried to paint a sign, you know what a paint it is. Professional sign painters are incredibly skilled with a paintbrush. They would paint the white after the fact and have a nice clean edge. I can't do it. I've tried. Um, so... I'm trying to think of other, oh, the bowl rims. Again, I will, um, I carve them. Then I put the black paint on uh, with a very dry foam brush, trying not to get it into the carving around the rim. I usually then come back and clean up that edge on the inside of the bowl with, on the lathe, um, do my last tiny bit of sanding there. And then I put the salad bowl finish right over the milk paint so that the whole thing is sealed with, uh, well, they call it general finishes um, bowl finish now, but they used to call it salad bowl finish. Um, but you're right, uh, we could spend a whole nother workshop on finishes and, and how you get the best results. Uh, you could easily put that milk paint on first on the rim and then carve through it. The only problem with that is sometimes when you carve, you get little frilly edges and you wouldn't be able to go back and sand them off. I don't really see any here, but it just allows me to go in and do that final sanding before I put the, the milk paint on. Thanks, Chris. Oh, sorry. Chris, um, we have a professional sign maker in our maker space. And um, the process he uses for, for painting his signs is He'll paint the base color, he'll paint the, the material base color first. Um, then he puts a, a material, he masks it with a material, some kind of vinyl material. 
then he'll cut through that material so you have the lettering and then he'll paint uh, what gets cut and then just peel off the plastic. So it's kind of- Yeah, a- that just, you know, I just saw that at a reasonable price on Amazon and I've ordered some because I really want to see how it works. It depends on how well it sticks, but if it sticks well, boy, that would help. Um, yeah, so it's a clear film that you mask it so that you can paint the lettering and not care about getting up over stuff and then you peel it off. Um, I'm glad to hear that he's using it. I will, I definitely intend to try it because I think if that can really to, be helpful. If you want me to put you in touch with him, I'm happy to do that where you can come visit our makerspace and meet with him or? Yeah, well, I, yeah, just uh, send me an email, contact. I'll ask him which product he uses because it's on my list of things to do next. Yeah, I've used some of his material. Didn't look all that expensive. Buys it in big rolls, so right, you know, probably economy right. of scale there. So this right. makes obviously makes a lot of signs. So um, yeah, but he he sells signed paints, custom made signed paints all the time, and that's the process he uses. So yeah, because man, if you're hand painting the interior of the letters, um, yeah, this this takes a lot of skill and a very that, steady uh, hand. That, that that eliminates that process. Oh, um, I I didn't mention, and I'd like to now. Um, you got to have high quality tools. So here are some of my smaller tools. Uh, let's see. I think I started off with a, a couple of V-carve bits and a round nose bit that I just got from Rockler. All right. You can use any router bit in there, but your, your standard router bit is, is not super high quality. Um, uh, upcut spiral bits are essential for when you're cutting deep so that the chips come up out of it. But if anyone's ever used an upcut bit in a router with a chuck with only four jaws, you know, inside the chuck has little jaws, little cutouts that hold the router bit, you know that it can easily ride up and ruin your, we were doing a breadboard end on a dining room table and the bit rode up and, and we had to go to a different, uh, we had to actually do two pockets and glue in the tenon. But this particular uh, spindle, it has 12 slots. Let me can bring it right up close if I can. Yeah, so you can see how it's got 12 slots. So they tighten really well. And I have a half inch collet and a quarter inch collet. And then um, Amana Tools is really good. And so is uh, toolstoday.com. This is a sign maker's kit, half inch spindle. And an important one is the, is the flat one over here because after a while, your sacrificial wood surface gets beat up. Anytime I cut through, I try to remember to put a, a thin piece of quarter inch sacrificial plywood under there so I don't cut into the wood. But you know, you forget sometimes. And at some point you wanna reflatten it. And so that big wide bit is so you can go down and absolutely flatten the surface, all right? So that when you're taking your top of the block, it's gonna be exactly the same everywhere all around your piece. Well, I hope that was a helpful introduction. As I said, none of you are gonna be able to go out and, and you know use something in a makerspace without some help and some direction. But at least you get an idea of some of the things that you can do. YouTube videos are great for getting ideas. Uh, one of the things I've been trying to explain to makerspaces, particularly there's one here in Hanover um, in the library, and then the one down in uh, Claremont, is they've got to train some staff really well so that their staff can help the members use these machines. Because you could easily damage the machine, but more likely you would just have a miserable experience with it. And a, and a lot of our members who, who tried to use a Claremont makerspace had a, had a not so great experience trying to learn how to use stuff. And then they don't want to be members anymore. So, you know, the Dartmouth Eng Engineering School is a great model. They'll have five or six professionals on staff able to help. And then they have eight or 10 students able to help who are student workers. And so when a student comes in to do a project, they have one-on-one -on -one help learning how to use the machines. Um, and it really, that kind of is what it takes. Um, uh, these guys, in Columbus, they, they now do a training session. Uh, I don't know if it's like three days or a week. Uh, I didn't want to go to Columbus. If I'm going to spend my money, I don't think Columbus, Ohio is where I wanted to, to go for a week. Um, 
but uh, but they do the a training, and, and I'm sure other places would too. But where you're actually, you know, you need a good two or three days of hands-on experiencing it, one-on-one -on -one help, um, you know, doing a bunch of different things to, to get the idea of it. Or if you're a self-directed learner, watch YouTube videos, you know, you can always call and ask their tech support people. They're very helpful and, and a little bit of trial and error. Um, but always be, be cautious as to what you might do that would the, damage the machine. So like a friend of mine got, a, I think, a shop bot, accidentally set it to go off the bottom of the block instead of the top of the block. Is that right? So when it went to do its first pass, instead of doing it, you know, 0.2 below the surface, it was going to go 0.2 below the bottom. And therefore, it plunged really deep, and, and, it, and it blew a fuse. It actually had a fuse in it. So it blew a fuse, um, which was better than damaging the machine. But uh, you know, the laser, I don't think there's too much that you could do to that, necessarily. Um, it can run into something if you, if you leave a tape measure in there, for instance, and it has to pass over that, and it bumps into it. What mine does, because uh, yeah, we have done that before. It'll just turn off and say, you know, Z-axis malfunction. You just turn the machine off and back on again. Um, the laser in here is not in a dust-free environment. It really ought to be, but I just don't have a dust-free environment. So I blow the sawdust out of it a couple times a year and hope for the best. Um, my computers are covered in dust. They have, they're, they're, they have dust protection. You know, I bought ones that said, you know, really good dust protection. I'm sure they're full of dust, um, but they've lasted. I had one eight years in here, uh, a Mac full of sawdust and it still works fine. Uh, the CNC machine is gonna make a ton of sawdust. So it needs to be somewhere where you don't care that there's a mess. Um, you know, we're all woodworkers, we, we're used to that. Hey, Chris, the um, height presetting Tool is that to a set height like two inches or something? And uh, you know, I've like never continuity. actually measured it, but but it's it it calculate you, you buy the top the block comes with it, so okay. it's built into the software to subtract that amount to get your zero. Um, the other way to do it is to come down and actually touch the wood, but of course, if you go too deep, you're going to put a dent in the wood. Yeah. Um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I like I think this time that if that little puck is sitting on a piece of sawdust or something, you'll be too high. And so I think if this were my project, I would have run it again a millimeter lower um, because the, the individual lines in there weren't quite as thick as I'd like them. You can cheat just a little bit by going a little bit lower. The other thing is if you have really thin lines and then you sand, you know, it doesn't take much sanding to make that line go away, you know, go down to almost nothing. So particularly with a soft wood and with a fine lettering, you know. So I'm always telling kids, you know, they love to take the sander and, and point it down and dig a ditch, right? Can't tell you how many tabletops they make and then we put them in the sunlight. You can just see where they've dug ditches with their sander. All right, let's not use up any more of this beautiful day. Uh, I don't know what you guys are doing watching a, a, a Zoom demonstration today. Um, but anyway, it'll be recorded. It'll be available. You can watch it again. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions. And uh, I wish you the best of luck if you get a chance to use one of these machines. They open up a lot of possibilities. Um, one of the philosophical conversations my class always has is what does it mean to be handmade and is there an intrinsic value in something that is handmade and and as perfect as you can get it but usually with some imperfection versus something that's machine made maybe perfect but is that craftsmanship or not you know is that as valuable as an antique or not and uh it's, it's just an interesting conversation to have chris oh. The demonstration you put a lot of work into it and i think our members are going to really enjoy this and we he did put a email together and i'm going to send it out with, with a bunch of links so we'll get it sent out to you as soon as possible so we'll end the meeting and have a great day everyone chris thanks a million Thank you. yeah really take care and gary too thanks for uh
Yeah, Thanks big thanks to Gary for the technology side of things. Uh, I, I love it when technology works. <laughs>